and Adan. Joining us now is Barrister Rebecca Butler. Thank you very much for joining us. Can you just explain to us the different types of considerations that the judge had to look at yesterday to give that sentence to say, uh, you know, cousins will die in jail? Well, when a judge uh, performs the sentencing function, they look first at the offence and the seriousness of the offence and all of the aggravating features. Now in this, the judge was looking at, first of all, um, it was a kidnap and rape along with the murder. The judge was looking at the, uh, the way in which the murder was perpetrated, so the level of planning that, the, um, that Wayne Cousins had gone to. He then looked at you know, what must have been in Sarah's mind in those last few hours of her life, uh, looked at what happened after the death, and then considered, obviously, the, the, the big factor was that because he was a police officer and holding a position of trust, um, that, that that was akin to an act of terrorism or it was an akin to Sarah being murdered for one of the statutory reasons in the 2020 Act, which does permit the judge to do the whole life order. Uh, and then what the judge also does, he looks at the mitigating factors and, and the one mitigating factor that um, Lord Justice Fulford did look at was Wayne Cousins' early guilty plea but in fact he dismissed it. Now normally a defendant will get a discount for a, an, an early plea to save the victim's family from going through the ordeal again and to save a trial. But in this case, the judge felt that Wayne Cousins' remorse wasn't genuine. He'd manufactured a very strange story about a Balkan uh, people smuggling gang and how he was held in thrall to them. And he was he had handed Sarah over alive to them. And the judge also looked at the degree of planning that Wayne Cousin had gone to. And there was about a month to, to two months worth of planning in this case. So all of those, when you add the aggravating factors and the mitigating factors, the judge was still minded to pass the whole of life sentence. Yeah, if, if, if there had been anything less, uh, Rebecca, there would have been an outcry. Well, if there'd been anything less, of course, the judge would have then announced a tariff um, and, you know, or, or everything that is um, sort of dealt with by the judge is based on the facts that he's heard as put to him on the day. So he would have in any event put in a, a very, very high tar tariff on this case anyway. But now under the 2020 Act, he does have these powers for the, the, the whole of life sentence. So I, d I don't think anybody would deny that this is a correct use of judicial powers. And I would be extremely surprised if Wayne Cousins uh, appealed this sentence. One of the other things the judge mentioned is that they still don't have a full account of what had happened uh, to Sarah. Of course, the only person who could give that information is Wayne Cousins. Had he done that, would it, would it have made any difference? Is there anything they could have done or presented in court which would have meant uh, that wouldn't have been the eventual outcome? No, because he got the maximum anyway. So um, you don't need to know even more prurient details because the details they knew were, the, were pretty, pretty bad. And the judge also did recognise in his sentencing comments, which are online, um, and I read them last night, um, the, the other thing that the judge mentioned was the sexual nature of the attack and the circumstance of the, of the arrest. I mean, both of which will have horrified women. It is worth noting that the Metropolitan police have issued a statement and I have never ever seen them do this before and they issue a statement on the circumstances of Wayne Cousin and his career, the vetting that he went to and also rather interestingly at the final paragraph almost a work of fiction of what women are meant to do now in the event that a lone police officer tries to arrest them. And it is a work of complete and utter fantasy because the Met Police are now suggesting that if a woman is arrested by a police officer without reasonable excuse, she, she could run into a local house, flag down a bus, shout for a passerby. Now, now that's just a ludicrous suggestion, largely because 
in a case where a police officer is genuinely arresting somebody, those will be charged as attempts to resist arrest. But it doesn't go to the core issue of how the police could allow a man like this on the streets, given, and I really, really stress this, that red flags were going up about Wayne Cousins all over the place. He was known as the rapist. He was known to have been um, posting and texting highly inappropriate messages on his WhatsApp. He was known to be very, very favorable to violent porn. And in the context of 16 women dying at the hands of police officers in the last 13 years, the trust in the police is at an all time low. And I think that the Met Police is now facing its Me Too mo moment because the, the woodwork, woodwork is going to start crawling now with stories of people who have complained about police officers or were too afraid to complain about police officers who have then gone on to commit offences against women. This is a really, really big moment for the police. Is there also, Rebecca, I mean, there's obviously, a, a, this, is a bit, this is a big moment for the police and they do have questions to answer, but also a big, a big moment for society as well. Um, uh, I've, I've been speaking to a friend of mine who is a, she's a serving uh, police officer in the Met and she, she stressed that, um, of course, the police have questions to answer, but uh, Wayne Cousins uh, may have tried to carry out this offence in some, no matter who he was working for, and the society itself also has to look at how men treat women. Yeah, but we hold the police to a higher standard than the general public. Um, we give them a warrant, warrant card with our consent. We allow them to carry handcuffs with our consent. Now, in a situation where I accept that the indecent assault that he was known definitely to have committed was 72 hours before the Sarah Everard kidnap. But there was a 2015 allegation that a car linked to him had been involved in an indecent assault as well. And, you know, having worked in with sex criminals for many years myself, I know that the early signs of uh, somebody escalating their behaviour pretty much always start with an indecent assault. So they acknowledge that their vetting procedures could have been better, but the issue is the red flags were going up during his employment. So this is why I say this is a Me Too mo movement is about to start in the police, not dissimilar to what we saw with Stephen Lawrence, because you have we are going to see now women coming forward saying, well, you know, such and such an officer did such and such to me, but I was too scared to report it. There is institutional um, laddish behavior in the police. You're, you know, you're giving people a huge amount of power at a very, very young age. They're, they, you know, they're, they're possibly not the best people um, who go into the police. They're going to have to look at all of this sort of thing. And of course, it is an extremely rare event. It is highly unlikely to happen ever again. But the police are now, in my opinion, going to be overwhelmed with serving officers, some serving female officers saying, nobody listened to me when I raised the flag against a particular officer. And that's what institutional problems look like. Having seen the meeting, Rebecca, thank you very much. Rebecca Butler, barrister, talking us through some of the implications.